trade traps. Mm -hmm. Ready? Yep. So tasty bite accounts are twenty five thousand dollars or less. It could be could be twenty five hundred dollars to twenty five thousand dollars. We just picked a number um, for smaller size accounts based on the crazy old archaic pattern day trading rules. Right. So so pattern day trading is anything under twenty five thousand. So we just had to pick a number. So and and margin accounts are anything over two thousand. So two thousand twenty five hundred to um, to. Um, uh, twenty five thousand. We call that a tasty bite account. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do a segment today on trade traps. Trade traps. I like trade it. traps. Trade traps. We're gonna fire Say off that ten times fast. Um, we're gonna fire off a ridiculous amount of information at you today. So you're gonna like it, especially coming up um, after opening bell is a great another great market measure segment. Today we'll be covering earnings plays and kind of you know you want to talk about time of the day to trade. Well, we did a whole segment on it. I think mm -hmm. you're going to like it. So let's do trade traps first. For a trader just getting started, it's important to develop a solid trade approach to improve your probability of success. Today, we'll look at some of the more common traps. Fair enough. Not a word we use very often, but something that we're just trying to um, get more into the flow of the conversation. A successful trade approach should include... A statistical should be statistical, mechanical, and logical. This includes HBT trades, proportionate size and consistent risk, proper strategy around binary events, reasonable time frame, giving yourself duration, and a proper exit strategy, which includes managing winners. This is stuff that we talk about all the time. It's just a small rehash. And let me tell you, when you think, we sometimes we think, oh my God, we did this yesterday, we did this the day before, we did this the day before. Then we think about, we got to do this every single day forever. That's correct. And we you have get new people listening. And not, that's it's not just new repetition. people. Last night I got an email from somebody that was on the on the trading floor for thirty years, and he's like, "I've learned more in in the I found you guys three weeks ago through a friend. I've learned more in the last three weeks than I learned in thirty years on the trading floor." He goes, "Where'd you guys learn this stuff? You're just <laughs> like me." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "Yeah, I know, but we've been gone for a while. <laughs> right. you know, so so we got to spend some time. You're right. We're all just we've evolved. Same. Yeah. yeah, I'm not even sure if it's evolved. We've just spent a lot of time." Talking about it. Well, you have to adapt. You have to change your trade. It's repetition. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next slide. So what are some of the things that can go wrong when a trader who attempts to implement a trade strategy around these concepts? I mean, it's not that easy. And and somebody else emailed me last night and said, Tom, um, I'm ready to go to the next level. What do I do? Mm -hmm. And just from the way they wrote the email, it's amazing the level of articulation they had about all the stuff that we just talked about. And I said, you know what? You, you kind of get it. The next level is just doing it more. Right. That's it. So you trade using high probability, but here's the problem. The, the number one trap, the number one trap is not creating enough occurrences. We've talked about this often, and number of occurrences seem to be the thing that has changed everybody's uh, trading. There is, um, we used to, we used to know it, but we, we used to kind of know it in a roundabout way, but we couldn't figure it out. We used to know that the traders that we had throughout the years that we traded with, and we also used to know the traders that were the most successful of our friends. Like I had a friend that was a really successful trader and he traded a ridiculous amount. He was like a, he was like 10 times crazier than we were as far as just number of trades. He was ridiculously successful. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, it's just number of occurrences. I could never, I don't think it was that easy to figure out. It's right in front of your face and it's hard to figure out. Of course. So for individual investors, the single biggest issue is not doing it enough. Very good. And I'm, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that we can sugarcoat that. Like, like you could read a thousand books. Yeah, but it goes counter, uh, counter to what everybody else says. I, I understand. This is why I'm spending so much time on this right now. Mm -hmm. You can read a thousand books. You watched a hundred thousand hours of video, and ultimately, it's enough real. T it's enough real time occurrences that is the difference maker. Sure, it, it allows you to be more diversified. It allows you to take advantage of different moves in the market. Trading small would be next, but go ahead. I was listening to um, I was listening to somebody talk about uh, professional a, a discussion on professional athletes the other day, and they were talking about um, there's 400 players or something in the NBA. I think there's 400 players, around 400 players in the NBA, and 300 of the 400 are virtually the same. What do you mean by that? Meaning that the reason that they're in the NBA is because they worked harder than the 3,000 or 30,000 people that didn't make the NBA. <laughs> There are probably a hundred, there's probably a handful of superstars. What, 30? 30 legit superstars sure. at different level. There's probably seven players that are at a different level than the superstars. And then there's, which is, uh, sorry, 70, which is a hundred, 
one quarter of the players in the NBA are at a different level. Then you get 300 players that are all at the level of, you know what, a lot of people could be here. Mm -hmm. A lot of people could be the 10th, 11th, 12th person on the bench. In that small pool. In that small pool, which may be a pool of 3,000 to 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. The difference is that the 300 people that are there in those last five or six spots on the bench have created enough occurrences they have put the effort in to get to a different level to separate themselves based on number of occurrences. Sure. Agreed. I know that seems I'm, – I'm just trying to put a now, an analogy up there so that um, – because none of us can compete on a superstar level in sports. But there are – what I'm trying to say is that 75 percent of even the professional ranks of any business – Many of us could have competed at different points, if it's not physical, but at different points in our life, we just haven't had the number of occurrences to get there. Most of what we do on, on this show is because of the number of occurrences and experiences that, we, that we've had. When somebody We're, says, like, why did you do this at that point? It's just because of number of occurrences and what you've seen in the past. It's typically how it reacts to that type of move. We're going to have an intern on at 9 o'clock this morning who's working for us all summer who 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 is who I'm going to joke— Effectively known as Willie T. But who I'm going to joke with about, about um, there are certain aspects of finance now where I think he's more clear of the concept than any professor at Wharton. And I mean that. Mm-hmm. And it all it is is number of occurrences. Not that he can get into Wharton, but yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a based on number of occurrences. It's the fact that once you actually start doing something, your whole world of finance changes. Of and what you originally thought finance was is something completely different after you make 100 trades. <laughs> then you understand capital markets. You understand liquidity, efficiency. You understand strategy. And your level – and you also understand – You also how, understand bullshit. Well, you also understand probabilities and how to figure out expected move. And as soon as that happens, your whole view of finance is completely different. That's based on number of occurrences. So he came here with no number of occurrences. Now he has whatever, a couple of dozen, probably in a couple of months, let's say 50 or 60 trades, whatever it is. All of a sudden, that number of occurrences puts you in a whole different league than every other kid at your at your grade level. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. Not enough premium in sale, meaning that it, it, implied volatility is just too low. So there's not enough premium to sell out there. And so what happens is you end up with positions on that don't look like the positions you want to have on. You know, as throughout the years as traders, we know when we have bad positions on. I can remember many times just looking at my stuff and going, what the hell did I do? Like, what was I thinking? This is not what I want to have on. Mm-hmm. This is not my, this is not the position that I want to have on. And I don't know how I got in this position. Like, I just got my too big an ego. I got too, too many dumb trades, whatever it is. This is not the position I have on. So as retail investors, we don't have the luxury to be wrong. Correct. Remember, it, when you are when you're a um, when you're the casino and you're the house, you or you're the bookie, whatever it is, you have the luxury of being a little bit wrong. It's a built-in edge there, sure. Because you have a built-in edge. When you don't have that edge, you don't have the luxury of being wrong because you can't make it back. Right. You gotta be hundred percent. Let's go back to the superstar discussion again. Superstars have the luxury of taking risk and being wrong. A Michael Jordan type player can miss 13 shots in a row if he has to, mm-hmm. and he's still going to come out shooting. The 12th guy on the bench, he misses three in a row. He's yanked out of the game. He's not seeing playing time for the next month. Right. And and that's the difference. You do not have the luxury of being wrong. There's not enough premium, with, which in this case means not enough premium to sell. Or you are too close to at the money. So you've done – kind of some stuff right, but you haven't executed the mechanics. I've had more than our share of emails over the years just suggesting that, you know, hey, I think I did everything right, but you didn't. I'll, I'll look it up, I'll break it down. You're like, oh, okay. And that's just, that just comes from the experience of not enough occurrences. So give me in a tasty bite size account. What would be like number of occurrences in a, in a, in a month? So you? so a perfect question. I do this with Case all the time. I want her at a very minimum to have the equivalent of 20 to 30 trades a month. Okay, so you're talking about almost one a day. On average, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that could be in and out. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I understand. Right. You're just Um, talking about engagement. Some Tasty Bites, I've had, I've seen customers with, you know, five or $10,000 trade 4,000 times a year, Mm -hmm. believe it or not. Right. And I've also seen people with, you know, um, with that trade, you know, 14 times a year. So it really just depends. Let's go next slide. You trade with consistent size and risk, but... You lose it. You trade too big in one trade. You just all of a sudden think, wow, this is too good. 
Mm-hmm. And if it looks too good, it is too good. Right. It's just we it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, probably a duck. We have the unique ability to pick the worst time to get big. As a, it's just, it's it's a cultural. It's it's everybody deals with that. It's it's the one. Mis- it's the major mistake in business. Um, the the I, I've used this example on the show before, but I just have to say it one more time. Helping out a friend once, somebody um, somebody offered us a franchise for something, and I was the money behind it. <laughs> I had no interest in running the franchise. More money, more money. So I, I tell this story because it's one of my favorite. I, I thought I was way smarter than this. You can buy one franchise for 15000 or you can have 10. The volume for, discount. Or you can have 10 for like $25. i will take the 10. Yeah, of course. <laughs> never realizing I'm never going to get past the one. So, or whatever it was. Or you could have 10 for 30 Okay. Right. Why would I ever buy one when I could have 10 for 30 So, um would you like to supersize that for an extra 15 cents? Of course. They do it at the movie theaters all the time. Hey, this drink, this size drink costs four seventy five. But if you want 73 ounces, it's only $5. Right. They do it with popcorn, too. You didn't get yeah. the popcorn bag, let's say, for, for $3. Or for an extra 50 cents, you can get the gallon size with free refills. So I can eat 4,000 calories and be sick. Okay, but it's too big in one trade. Inconsistent risk in one trade can negate many small winning trades, too. Yep. That's like all of a sudden, you know, because we're too big, we do something too stupid. And we do that all the time when we're gambling. Sometimes if we bet big, we won't double down. If we bet big, we won't split them because we just don't want to put more money up on the table. So the, one of the big problems with um, one of the big problems with success is our own inconsistency. So if we're looking for kind of what our trade traps are, it's too big in one trade. It's inconsistent risk in trades. And it is not enough diversification in our strategy selection because we get hung up on, on, Hey, this worked for me last time. That's right. This worked for me last time. This worked for me this time. Again, right. Yeah. So, so that's another thing that happens to us kind of all the time. Hey, this worked. I don't need to do that. Of course. Keep going. Okay. So your trade strategy, um, in this case, your trade strategy around two binary events, First, not recognizing that data decay shows two weeks prior to earnings, which reduces return on capital by not closing before then. And two, missing earnings entirely. This relates to our overall market awareness. One of the things that – it doesn't have to be earnings. It could be any event. Um, One of the things you can't plan for is like, for example, what happened yesterday with the fertilizer stocks. There is no planning for those stocks opening down, whatever, $12, $14. You can't plan for that. Sure. Um, 30% move. A 30% move. There's no like, oh – Ring the bell. There's a 30% move today. You cannot plan for that. The difference is that things that are known, I mean, I guess, you know, here, an example I was, again, I, I have always use lots of horrible sports analogies. The example here is um, the, N- the NFL is on a flexible schedule. So what that means is you have tickets for a game in early December, and you think it's a noon game. But all of a sudden, they change it to 7 o'clock at night, and you don't know that. So right. you show up at noon. You know, I, I sometimes I'll 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 have tickets to a game like a Bulls game, and they change it from a nighttime game to a day game. I miss the game. <laughs> it happens all the time with baseball games too. You know, it, we we call these flexible schedules. Well, the 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 fact that you're not aware that's market awareness. Mm-hmm. With our money, we should be aware. I've always so of we should be aware of dividends, earnings. N- some things like that. We don't have that much stuff to to work on. Not that difficult. That's right. Mm-hmm. Just I can get say a engaged. Not I can say difficult. over the years, have I missed stuff? Absolutely. Do I miss a lot of stuff? Not really. Mm-hmm. Okay. You also have more positions probably than most people have. Also, of course. Improper time frame duration selection. Selling weeklies with little to no premium. Or too much time to expiration leads to a decrease in return on capital. State of decay is much less for longer durations. So let's let's stop here for a second. Improper time frame duration select in our selection process. Selling weeklies with little or no premium doesn't give us a lot of time to be right. We'll sell weeklies around certain events, but for the like most earnings. part, but for the most part, we just need more time to be right. Duration over direction, hundred percent. And I get so many emails from people, and it typically starts on the order entry and the timing that they're doing. If they're already trading small and they're trading often, they say, "Hey, options expire." I mean, it makes common sense. I mean, it's common sense when you think about the logic. Options expire uh, fastest the last week of expiration. Why not trade weeklies if I'm selling premium? But you know what? Everybody knows that already. And typically, our direction is wrong. And what happens is we don't have enough time to be well, right. Typically, it's not wrong. Fifty. 
percent. Well, fifty percent of the time you're wrong. And, for you, and, fifty-four. <laughs> and that fifty percent when you're wrong is it always feels like it's greater than the fifty percent time that you're right. Meaning the magnitude of the. Movie. Oh, it's easy to be right. It's very difficult to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, so we like a little bit more duration, and and then too much time to expiration leads to a decrease in return on capital. As theta decay is much less for longer durations. When would you go to longer durations? Well, when volatility is really high. Right. Because when you get really high volatility and you can lock it up, like, like you know, here, an example would be a mortgage. If your mortgage rates are are zero, or I'm sorry, not zero. Are, if your mortgage rates are like 3% and somebody says, would you like, would you like your loan at 3% for uh, one year, three years, or 30 years? Um, I'll take 30 years, right. Don. I'll take 30 years, or Alex, I'll take mm -hmm. 30 years, Alex, behind door number one. Why wouldn't you at 3%? I mean, how long are 30-year rates going to stay at 2.55 or 3%? They're already, you know, the 10-year rates are there now. Right. What – that makes total sense to me. But but are you going to lock up a – are you going to lock up a 30-year – I mean, I'm sorry. Are you going to lock up a 3% rate for one year when you know you're going to be in that house way longer than one year? It just makes sense. Mm -hmm. If something's really cheap, you lock it up. If something's really expensive, like I don't want to lock up a 20% interest rate. Right. I mean, everything is relative. Yes. If I have a 20% interest rate, I'm going for three years. Right. If but I have a 3% interest rate, I'm going for 20, 30 years. Of course. And, but you don't know if the 3% is going to go lower. Uh, that's This is, of course, the case. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to the next, second to last slide. Selecting an exit strategy. Not exiting when assumptions change. A huge problem that a lot of people have because they're looking at their stock and they're not looking at their marketplace assumptions or their portfolio assumptions, which is not actively managing winners and allowing them to become losers. And then timing exit around moments of illiquidity. There are, um, we tend to act when we're not supposed to act rather than act when Nobody wants to stack. In other words, I use this. I have a saying. I use it all the time here amongst all of our trading, which is take the money when you can, not when you have to. Mm -hmm. There's no money when you have to take it. There's tons of money when you don't want it. Right. And it's always worked for us. It's been a. It's worked for us trading wise. It's worked for us business wise. Take the money when you can. Don't take the money when you have to, and don't regret those decisions. You're not going to sell the top. If you take the money when you have to, you're either paying up or selling down. You're making. You're decisions. doing something on somebody else's market. Right. Okay. If I'm, uh, let's use another baseball analogy. If I'm one day before the trade deadline, and I got a sucky team, and I want to get rid of a pitcher with a with a lot of baggage and a big contract, and some other team needs pitching, they have to pay up mm -hmm. to take that pitcher away from me. That's the only way they're going to get it. Right. Otherwise, they're stuck with the team that they have. That's why these teams unload talent with one day to go because you can get a Panic lot for mode, it. Right. Well, it's not. Yeah, you get Whatever. a lot for it. I mean, right. You sell something when somebody else wants to buy it. You buy something, okay, when somebody else wants to sell it. When you need to sell something, there's no bids. Mm -hmm. No good ones, right. The the first time um, the first time we sold our company, the we thought the market on our company was 35% less than 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 the offer. Okay, this is a true story. You, the first time, the first I say the first time because it was multiple sales. The first time somebody came in and looked at looked around and said, "Hey, you know, what? I love your guys' company, and I want to buy it." Now we had an idea in our head what it was worth because mm -hmm. there was other people that wanted to buy it. Now sure. we didn't really want to sell it. I'm like, "Listen, I'm going to make you a market, but you're they not paid gonna... 35 percent over what you thought it was. That's worth. Right. So I'm going to make you a market, and and you're going to hate this market, but the, I don't want to sell. So I made a market, which was uh, again. 35% higher than I thought it was worth. Mm -hmm. And they go, done. What do you do? I guess you got to sell. That's right. Because <laughs> you made a market 35% mm -hmm. higher. And I tell this story and people are like, that's crazy. But then, you know, what? whatever. Right. Okay, yeah. but that that's what it is. And, and uh, you sell when you have to. You don't necessarily sell when you need to. Look at all the companies that, that didn't sell when they could. And now when they try to sell when they have to, they're out of business. Sure. And you can just go through the list of public companies like that, and it's just – it's extraordinary. I mean, it goes from Dell all the way on down to – you know, I mean, look, we laugh – we, we talk about the rally that Yahoo's had. At, uh, it's trading at 27 or $28 right now, but they had a $34 bid on the table, mm -hmm. cash. Mm -hmm. This is four years ago. Right. Okay, I mean, let's put it in perspective. While trading at times is an important – is it, and while trading at times is an art more than a science, knowing what works and adjusting – and what does not is the key to success. Lessons learned can be used as building blocks to help develop a more consistent and profitable trade approach. 
just to recap some of this stuff. Small accounts, mistakes are magnified over larger accounts because you have less room to make it up and you have less opportunity to make it up because you have a lower probability of success in a smaller account. It's the nature of the business. So when you have a tasty bite size account, you have to be very careful about your mechanics. And that's what they meant by adjusting. It's adjusting your mechanics, the entry, trading often enough, picking the proper strikes. That's right. The takeaways from this are number of occurrences, the, the underlying mechanics that we keep hammering home time after time, and then not falling in love you know, with what you have on. Understanding that profits are smart. Taking money off the table when it's there is smart because when you need to take money off the table, sometimes you can't do it. Right. It's 827. We've got a ton of stuff to do on opening here. We're going to be back in two minutes.